21 in title. Good morning, Brotherhood. <laughs> um, if I had to say a title for this message, I would say it's Motherhood and Suffering. Now, that doesn't mean that all mothers are suffering saints, because maybe they weren't a saint at all, and maybe you say, they sure made me suffer. <laughs> mothers are not perfect people. I know, because I am one. I'm a little weird. <laughs> These are a couple of my weird rules. The shampoo or detergent bottles must be completely empty before being disposed of. <laughs> and then they can't be put in the trash. Anything that can be recycled has to be put in the recycling container. So I'm frequently pulling things out of the trash. <laughs> I don't know, my kids just can't seem to get it. That's just <laughs> something. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, they do. Uh, they are getting it a little better now, but I still have to remind them now and then. Now, sometimes I tell my children that I'm allowed to be weird. <laughs> After all, I am 50 now, and I am the mom. <laughs> now, 50 may not seem really old to some of you, but I don't mind calling myself old because... You know, if we live to be a hundred, I'm at the top of the hill. <laughs> and a hundred is really a long life expectancy. Anyway, um, what I want to share with you is something I believe, not about me, it's not really about me. Um, something that I've learned about motherhood and suffering. Before I get started, I want to pay a special tribute to a few special mothers in my life. And then I would like to look briefly at an example of a mother in the Bible, back in the book of Ruth. And that is Naomi. Naomi's story shows us that God is still there, even in times of trouble. And if we are trusting in Him, He will work out the details of our lives. Even if we have trials, we know that we're going to have great joy in the end. And we will live with God forever. First, I'd like to tell you about my mom, who I think of as an angel in heaven, looking down on me. She gave up her life when she was only in her 30s, because she was married to my father, who was abusive. And my mom had not even finished high school, and she had five children, and she didn't have the will to fight to live and to fight my father. It was just too hard for her. But she trusted in God, and... She didn't worry that after she passed that her children would be taken care of. She had faith that her children would be taken care of. And after she passed, my Aunt Bonnie stepped in to rescue us from the abuse and neglect of my father. <clears throat> Bonnie was married to my father's brother. Uncle Gene was a state trooper in Kentucky. And they became our legal guardians until... Um, my uncle decided to cheat with Bonnie's best friend, and that was the end of their marriage. Um, Bonnie survived receiving only $100 a month from him, which even back in those days wasn't much money. Jean had always told us that it was Bonnie who wanted to take us, and it was also Bonnie who insisted that we not be split up. There were five of us children, and she kept all of us together. But after their divorce, I went to live with my oldest sister, and she became like a mom to me while I was in high school. My sister Carlotta and her husband Bobby. They were recent newlyweds, and though they had never been parents yet, they did their best to be like a parent to me. <clears throat> when I think about these moms and others I admire, I think of the things they suffered. God doesn't always prevent suffering in our lives. Sometimes he may take us around a trial, and sometimes he may carry us straight through. Suffering is not just a pointless exercise we go through, but there is value in suffering. We read this invitation from the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 1.8. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose 
and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus from the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel I was appointed an herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am, yet I am not ashamed. Because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. So why do I feel it is so important to talk about suffering? Because I don't want to see my children or anyone here who has begun life in Jesus Christ to be thrown off balance, to lose their faith in God because of suffering. Though it is unpleasant, suffering can draw us closer to God and teach us some valuable lessons. We can learn to identify with Jesus and his suffering and grow closer to God because of the trials we have experienced. In Hebrews 12, 2, we read, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. There are some who believe in God, in a God who, in God who think we are only called to walk in blessing and health. I don't know which Bible they are reading because the one I read shows me many examples of suffering. I think it is also important to know that if we are suffering, we are not necessarily being punished by God, as Job's friends thought back in the book of Job. Our suffering doesn't always doesn't mean God doesn't. Our suffering also doesn't mean God loves us any less or has turned his back on us. He tells us in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm not trying to say we have only suffering and persecution to look forward to when we turn to Jesus. If you thought that, you would probably say, where's the door? <laughs> Let's get out of here. That would be just as unbalanced as it would to say that we have only blessing and health. God also tells us to look to Him as our healer, and He does promise us many blessings in this life and in the life to come. I like this promise Jesus gave us in Mark 10, 29. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age and in the age homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. What this verse tells me is that if I have lost a mother, God has ways of giving me more, and he did, because I have a spiritual mother here named Judy, over there, <laughs> hi Judy, um, who gives me words of wisdom and sends up prayers on my behalf. I also have a relationship with my mom's identical twin back in Kentucky, my Aunt Faye. After many years, it's almost like my mom was given back to me. So if I can give you this word of encouragement, if you need a mom, ask God. If you really want a child, keep asking God. He will answer those prayers in very interesting ways. Don't give up. Keep praying. I have seen many answers to prayer right here in this congregation. But let me give a warning also about this. Seek God's will in your life and not just your own. I know myself, sometimes I'm stubborn and I think, I can do this myself. And I've experienced situations where I storm ahead and I do it my own way. But it doesn't work out so well. Now I try to remember to seek God's will first. When I, when I seek God's will, I found I have to pray. And sometimes I have to cry out more passionately. And then I have to be patient and wait. And then suddenly the answer becomes clear. We need a balanced picture of the truth of God by reading the whole word of God. We need the whole truth. A half truth is not really the truth. Now I would like to go back and look briefly at the book of Ruth from the point of view of Naomi. 
She was an Israelite. We see the beginning of the story in Ruth 1, 1 through 2. And Pastor Burmy went through the book for us recently, so I'm not going to cover the whole story, but just some of the high points from the point of view of Naomi. We see that Naomi had a husband and two sons. And I kind of think of her, I would, the picture of the game of life came to my mind. I don't know if any of you have played the game of life. I'm not talking about real life, I'm talking about the board game. <laughs> if you've ever played the game of life, you get a little car, and you're going to acquire a spouse pretty quickly, and you're going to have children, and you go riding off in, on this board game with your family, and you experience a lot of different things. Well, here Naomi goes off with her husband and her two sons. So if I'm Naomi, I'm feeling pretty blessed because not only do I have a husband, you know, if something happens to him, I still have two sons who can take care of me, right? <sighs> sure, this famine is a temporary setback and, you know, we have to go to the land of Moab for a while, but I have confidence it's going to work out all right. But, as is often the case with our plans, sometimes it takes a little longer than we think. And here her sons end up growing up in Moab and taking wives. I'd like to point out it wasn't necessarily a sin for them to marry Moabite women. Even though at one point the Israelites were told to separate themselves from foreign wives, that was more because the men were following their wives into the false idol worship. And God create, created and loves all people from every race. He's not a respecter of persons, but he looks on the heart. God chose Rahab the harlot from the land of Jericho to be a part of the very lineage of Jesus. She married Salmon, and they became the parents of a son named Boaz. Now, back to the story. There's a sudden turn of events in verses 3 through 6. Naomi loses both her husband and her sons. Now she's in a foreign land with no man to take care of her. Being a widow was not an easy life. No social security, no Medicare, no retirement fund. Now in verse 6, Naomi hears that the situation in Israel has improved and she's getting homesick. She starts the journey back to Israel with her two daughters-in-law joining her. Now if I were Naomi, I can just imagine what she's thinking as they're walking, making this journey. She's saying to herself, what if I'm making a big mistake taking my daughters-in-law back with me to Israel? I had land back in Israel, but I have no assurance that I will be able to claim it. Sure, there's this law about a kinsman redeemer, but I'm too old to have a husband and bear children. I don't know if any of my near kinsmen are even still living. As a poor widow, maybe I can beg, but what will become of these daughters of mine? What if harm comes to them, and then I will feel responsible for bringing them here? And we know how many Israelites may be prejudiced against them because they are Moabite. So Naomi begins to try to dissuade Ruth and Orpah from going with her. Orpah is persuaded to go back home, but Ruth is determined to stick with Naomi. In verse 16, we read Ruth's inspiring pledge of commitment to Naomi. Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything from but death separates you and me. She was making this pledge to her mother-in-law, who was probably, probably just like a mother to Ruth. <laughs> we can tell from her words that she has learned to have faith in the God of Israel from Naomi's example. In verse 19, Naomi and Ruth arrive in Israel. Time and trials must have taken a toll on Naomi because the women exclaim, can this be Naomi? Maybe she didn't look much like she did when she left. Then the realization of all she has lost hits Naomi, and she cries out in grief, verse 20. Don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter 
I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune on me. At this point, Naomi has lost sight of the fact that God loves her and has a plan for her life. She's crying out because this is now her situation as she sees it. But we have the rest of the story. The story takes another turn in chapter 2, and Ruth just so happens to end up gleaning grain in the field of Boaz. Verse 3, we read, As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. I love it. Have you ever found yourself saying, it just so happened, or by coincidence? If we're trusting God with our lives, there's no such thing as a coincidence. I'm going to skip to the end of the story in chapter 4, verse 14. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will, he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So God did give Naomi a son in a very unexpected way. And even when her situation appeared to be hopeless, God did still love her and have a plan for her life. I can say that because we have the advantage of hindsight. We can see in this story that God has worked out the details of Naomi's life so that her son has a place in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And I don't believe that God left the birth of his son Jesus up to chance. In conclusion, I just want to ask you this question. Would this story about Naomi be nearly as interesting if she hadn't gone through the suffering first? What if her husband and sons did not die? What if they had just made the trip back to Moab after the famine and said, here we are, we're ready to reclaim our land. It is precisely because God delivered Naomi through a great trial that makes the ending so satisfying. Maybe you can identify with this. I know I can because it is the times of my greatest trials when I know that it is God who delivered me. And that is just one reason why I praise him. Thank you.